Welcome to a new special series of episodes that we've launched in partnership with the Faculty of Public Health. This series will aim to explore one key question. What is public health? It may seem like a simple question, but public health is no single thing. The series aims to shine a light on a huge range of work delivered by the diverse public health workforce as we talk to key figures in public health from across the UK and explore this question, as well as what inspired them to go into their career and what they think are the key challenges lying ahead. My name is Josh Hawkins and I'm a public health registrar. And today I welcome Jennifer Dixon, Chief Executive of the Health Foundation, a leading independent foundation committed to bringing about better health and healthcare for people in the UK. Jennifer trained and practiced in medicine before moving into health policy, where prior to the Health Foundation, she was Chief Executive of the Nuffield Trust and prior to that, Director of Policy at the King's Fund. She has served on boards of organisations, including the UK Health Security Agency, the Health Care Commission, the Care Quality Commission and others. And in 2013, was awarded the CBE for services to public health. Jennifer, hi. Really good to have you with us today. Very pleased, Josh. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you. So do you mind if we start by exploring a little bit in a day of the life of, please? Yeah, now this is the, this is a, a tricky one because it's so varied, I would have to say. Uh, and my job, I really do think I've probably got the best job in Britain uh, leading the Health Foundation because so many things influence health, as we know, and we'll get on to when we talk about defining, trying to define public health. So to give a flavour, some days I'm working on uh, economic inactivity in Barnsley. Other days, it's the Cancer Research UK strategy. Other times, it's looking at inequalities in health in the northeast. Others is the future of the NHS and technological advance and how to regulate AI. So there's a whole variety of things that I now sort of have to be across. And the older I get, and obviously the more experience you have, the more more knowledge you develop. So you can begin to join dots and try to see a signal amongst all this noise. But I think it feels a great privilege to have been around for so long and to be able to see these patterns, uh, which means that what might bamboozle, what what might have bamboozled me by variety uh, 20 years ago now just seems okay to to manage and sort of extract the juice for what is, is the most relevant thing to health. Then there are just so many factors that are important. It's important to, to, to clock those, understand the most important ones and where you can politically act, but also not get lost in the noise or weeds. So a short answer is that the typical day is very varied. And then, of course, there's managing the foundation itself, which is we've had 250 people and significant grants, portfolios and and research going on in-house. So all of that takes time. Uh, So I've got a very good top team to have built. So a combination of internal and external and indeed sometimes international work is part of my normal goings on, I would say. You mentioned the art of joining those dots, seeing the patterns up. Is that how you see sort of a public health career in policy, understanding those patterns and those roles and joining the dots? Or is that more just at the level that you're working at and and how else did it change as you're going through? I think it's more the level I'm at, but I, I would say it's more fundamental than that. I, I mean, I started life as many people in public health do in medicine, or at least a very technical sort of subject. And you really have to sort of know the detail and know your stuff. Um, But as time went on, I'm the kind of person who likes to see, I like to present it with a whole lot of noise and for me to figure out what the signals are in that noise. And I think that's the kind of strategic nous that you kind of understand whether you have or not as you go through time. Running an organisation like mine um, you're not just a manager, of course, that's a small, that is an important part of the job, but really it's strategic intelligence and now so what's important, what isn't, what's going on, how do you pick out the most important thing, what's the vision, is something that's very important at this level. And it will be true of many people in these types of role or senior, senior roles, I would say, to have some kind of strategic intelligence, because stuff comes at you the whole time. And if you, if you just swim in lane in your technical work which is quite possible you know you might be a chief science officer for example you need to know your stuff but as if you're leading an organization or operating on a bigger canvas if you don't sort of clock the extra currents this this wider terrain you can be quite frankly ambushed and uh, it's a risk 
Uh, so as well as you might not be as effective as you need to as well. So I think I think I've kind of selected myself into this type of job where the, 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 you come into the job with a role, with a mission. But actually, in my world, there's a kind of a blank sheet of paper, more or less, for you to then write on a script that you think is the most intelligent for this organization. So to have freedom to do that is, is something I've always sought for, simply because I, I'm aware of this kind of facility that I have. And I obviously don't have other facilities, but this is the one that I kind of have dined out on more than anything, I would say. Some of those key challenges that you need to be able to address, not just swimming in lane, perhaps we'll come back to. If we start with the initial question, so public health is, you know, as a career, as as an idea, as many things to many people. What does it mean to you? Josh, I think this is the most difficult one. What is public health? And uh, 40 years on, I would say that, uh, you know, it's still a question. I mean, I think the, the the broad answer is that anything that advances health and mitigates the risk of ill health is something that I would probably include in that. And so that obviously spans a multitude of areas from healthcare to managing the risk factors, turning to the wider determinants, including the commercial determinants uh, of health. And even that can go global, can't it? So I think there's a variety of things there, both in relation to non-communicable disease, mental health, and also communicable disease. Uh, And so that really is a broad canvas. You can be right in the weeds in specific areas of risk factors or wider determinants or healthcare, uh, or you can be operating at at a different level where you're trying to bring all those things together to, I don't know, for example, work with coalitions to act on with investors on the commercial determinants. You know, that's a really sort of way off example. I I appreciate you saying that sending out your way is a a difficult and broad question and it can mean so many things. So there's so many people, you know, at the start, middle or or end of your career as well, it can change. And I think that the key priority of the series is, is just to showcase some of that diversity and, and I think you're a wonderful person to to lead off with this about the, the breadth of questions and issues determinants that you consider day to day like you say working with industry and investors or you know working politically advocating um working with research and academia to covering so many different aspects the 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 career you, you mentioned medical work previously and the change as as it is into public health it can be seen as quite a a hard change by some people. Um, I've gone through that change myself from, from clinical medicine into public health. But equally, it's it's using a lot of the same training and the same theory and the same drive that a lot of us went into medicine for in the first place. So what, what attracted you to a career in public health? Yes, I mean, so yes, I, I started off in medicine and um, I did five years of medicine, pediatric medicine, actually. And what I found there was that um, I really enjoyed the medicine uh, and the more technical it got, I was doing paediatric cardiology and neonates by the end. So that was quite highly specialised. <clears throat> that was fascinating. But I was quite aware uh, in my late 20s of, you know, more things that I wanted to work on. So I thought, uh, and this is quite common, I get approached by quite a few medics in their late 20s, early 30s, who are just groping around trying to think about what to do. Is 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 there something more to clinical medicine? What else could they combine with it? And thankfully, there are lots of more opportunities then now than there were then. So I decided that what I would do is to just take um, a step out of clinical medicine. And it wouldn't necessarily be permanent, but it would just be to expose myself to more things to work out what kind of animal I was and whether or not there were other things. Because because if you're in medicine, as you know, it takes so much out of you. You don't really have time to think about um, or try else. So I entered public health training and did an MSc at the London School of Hygiene, and that exposed me to all sorts of things from communicable disease to epidemiology. Everyone listening will probably be very familiar. And it soon became obvious I was much more interested in policy and economics than I was in anything else. So then I, what I did effectively was then, after the MSc, took a year in the States as a Hartness Fellow, studied American health policy. Why were there so many un- uninsured? Why could the US political system not deliver that universal health care and then after that that was a, an eye-opener that really set me on the train away from clinical medicine and into policy and then I effectively did a PhD but continued my public health training and ended up working at the King's Fund after a few 
you know, publications in the BMG, I caught their notice and then entered the policy department at the King's Fund. And then from there, it was a short step to Nuffield and to the Health Foundation, I would say, but also spending a couple of years as the policy advisor to the chief executive of the NHS. I really feel that I did manage to sort myself into a much a groove that suited me and what I can contribute more and would have been able to pursue that. I mean, it's been a very, very fortunate and I feel utterly privileged to have done that. Same time, still linked with the public health community, but not working in traditional public health jobs, I would say. You've mentioned the the desire, you know, that you've seen in in other people who have come to you as well for finding something more, you know, there must be more to medicine um, or trying to trying to achieve more. And I think it's, it's it, you know, parallels thoughts I had as well coming in, being in clinic and, and wanting to to do more in a way that you, you can't do within the constraints sometimes of clinical medicine and what you can offer with treatment and with allied healthcare services. I mean, it's, it certainly sounds like you found some of that breadth coming into public health. You mentioned that the, the slightly non-traditional, even non-traditional public health route that you've taken through Harkness and, and policy and similar did you find it was accessible to to find your niche within public health I, it's certainly something that I, I've found as you, as you come in there's you're straight away aware of this breadth that you can go into is that something that you that you saw and enjoyed coming into it yes I mean I mean I was lucky I, I kind of saw it quite quickly what kind of and, and it's not a surprise because you know, in terms of policy and economics, I, I when I was at university, I was active in the student union politics um, and, and I wrote quite a bit. So I kind of knew that, that there was this strand. Um, what I wasn't quite convinced of is whether there was some way of combining that with with medicine to promote health. And uh, so I could soon then see that um, it was possible um, um, via I, I actually I wouldn't say via public health training that that was very important and very useful, valuable. But actually, I think what it what public health did for me, public health training, capital P, capital H, was to show me, give me a platform from which I could then find the the real route. Yeah, absolutely, and I think the faculty that obviously we're partnering with here will will appreciate the uh, the shout out. But I, I would agree, it is it is a, a good very good training program for the grounding and the theory and for enabling people to find their way. And, and particularly, you know, as, as you're describing the sort of person that's coming into the training program, wanting to make a difference and and, and wanting to do more and find their niche. I, I think it is very well set up for that, which is a, a boon, isn't it? It's really set up and the, the opportunities now to take some time out of the training system, to join various, um, you know, private offices or leadership um, that is, is absolutely phenomenal compared to when I when I was, you know, flathering around trying to piece together, um, you know, a, a kind of future. There wasn't very much around. You just had to make it up, quite frankly. And, and, and for me, just the space to be in America for a whole year with a blank sheet of paper, effectively, um, and then the PhD afterwards really did help me to sort myself out. If you've really got to try to find something that really tries to touch as many buttons as possible for it to be, become manageable and enjoyable. So I think don't close yourself down too early is what I'd say. Keep things open, try and take opportunities and try and reflect quite a bit that uh, to make sure what kind of animal you are, that you've sorted yourself into the right kind of groove before you really go for it, um, which you need to in order to advance if that's what you want to do. I think that's a fair and it harks back to that aspect of not just swimming in your lane you mentioned earlier. So um, we we can sometimes feel in in any career, let alone medicine, I think you you get on a treadmill, you're looking at next steps and promotions and similar um, and public health, you know, can seem that, like that substantial change. Um, but it's, it's that reminder that we we have a long career ahead and there are a wealth of opportunities. It's true. And and the other thing is not to not to say otherwise, but that there are some people who really, really just want to swim in lane. They really want to be the best HIV specialist. They really want to be the best, you know, gen um, genomic mapper of pathogens or, you know, whatever it is. And that's completely and utterly fine. I think the main thing is just to make sure that if you if you're doing that, that you aren't secretly somebody else that really wants to get out, that, that you try and find that out as early as you can. That's yeah, that's, that's a good reminder. And you mentioned the the worth for you of the Harkness Fellowship um, and then and then subsequently the PhD in, in terms of 
seeing that opportunity, seeing that breadth, um, going to America, understanding how things work over there and, and, and drawing lessons from there. You now, am I right? You, um, you're involved in the Harkness Fellowship subsequent to that. So I suppose, is that part of, you know, maybe wanting to, to give back and, and carry on that, that tradition a bit as well? Yes, you really do want to give back and you want to sort of make sure that there's a really good pipeline of people coming up and there's a lot to impart. So yes, I'm very grateful to be able to co-fund the Hartness Fellowship Programme with the Commonwealth Fund of New York. So we select every year and four candidates and send them out, which is great for a whole year. But we also um, fund and founded uh, something else, which is going in the other direction, a European fellowship called Siana, which takes um, mid-career professionals uh, leaders actually to, um, to to it's not a it's not a, you don't go and live in in Europe but you you have uh, four sort of long sessions in Salzburg with um, uh, six Brits six Germans six Swiss people to be exposed to a whole variety of leadership issues and um, you know issues in health and care and uh, so uh, so that's that's another example and plus i try and mentor a few people where time permits so all of that it's probably not enough but i'm you know i hope to do more as i as i advance or, and get older no that's, that's that's really good to hear thank you well i did i did just want to briefly ask about the the harkness fellowship uh, i think a lot of people will be very interested in it what did you what did you cover for your harkness fellowship Yes, um, it really is the most fantastic program. Please think about it. So um, it's a year in the States. Um, you're situated in a in a usually a university. You have a mentor and you write the script for what you want to look at for the whole year. Uh, and then within the year, there are these seminars where you can discuss wider issues which are beyond your projects uh, to do with, for example, the wider, you know, how healthcare is organised in America. What are the issues? Why is it as it is? How 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 you can make change and how what blockchain things like that as well as health. So what I did, um, I was just absolutely intrigued why such an impressive nation can have um, thirty million odd people uninsured. How come? You know, how did they not sort of? How did they miss the the boat when it came to trying to? enact universal health care as many European systems did and indeed Canada did. So I basically, that was my my study. And I went around interviewing all sorts of people, policymakers, federal, local, state, um, and under, you know, tried to get under the bonnet of the healthcare system as well. My conclusion, which was that the social justice thermostat in the US is set too cold. They need to turn up the heat a bit, but well, Europeans would say that, the Americans would say that ours is too warm, but the concept of social justice and the safety net is just very different in the US, you know, which was a hard bullet to bite. But nevertheless, that was the primary reason why they didn't sort of go the whole hog in the 60s to have universal health care. But, you know, things change and the costs of care are absolutely astronomical out there and affecting jobs, the economy, everything as well as, um, uh, you know, having malign effects um, on the uh, economy. So um, I think I'm not um, losing hope out there, although the current political situation you know, gives you <laughs> gives you cause for worry. Um, so anyway, so it was, a, you could see it's a very broad thing to try and get your head round, but I really, really learnt masses and endlessly grateful for the opportunity. Thinking about the uh, one of the more pithy responses to the question of what is public health that I'm going to misappropriate, but it was um, public health is the the science of social justice, which I think is uh, it, it speaks to what you're what you're saying about a leading undercurrent of of some of some of the work we do. Yes, uh, yes, social justice is definitely a part of public health. Public health is a part of social justice, I would say, and uh, as is health. So I think uh, I think that's a fair description, pithy description we we discussed covering if that's okay so what public health challenge do you think we're not talking about enough and why goodness knows there's enough public health challenges aren't there i mean the one that i think that i'm not sure we're truly facing into is the apparent rise of mental distress both in teens which i know quite a lot has been written about but also, if you look at the figures of the in, in, the number of working age people who are economically inactive, 2.6 million in the country, which is a phenomenal amount. Depression, anxiety is a large part of that. 
And then also for those who are who are economically active, they, there's probably millions who are economically underactive because of some aspect of mental ill health. I know we've 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 had forays into social media and the impact of that. And that's very important. But it's this wider issue with um, the working age population as well. Uh, and for me, it kind of links to also our blind spot about social capital in the country and how do we measure that and associate our, and, and think about that as a, as a valuable capital for our prosperity. Um, I was looking the other day at some teen mental health figures and the phenomenal rates there are in teenage girls, in particular 15 to 19 year olds, but also how socially patterned those are by deprivation, which we would expect. But also there seems to be a protective effect of ethnicity, particularly Asian ethnicity, South Asian. And and you know, what is what why is that? Is that because of social capital that's protecting um, these communities against a more nuclear, blasted sort of white working class community? I don't know. And I, I really do think that we have to get much more on top of this. If we want our country to flourish, if we want the economy to flourish, even if you only care about that. So I, I think this is a, quite a big issue and it's underlying a lot of the social inequalities and health inequalities literature as well. This, the concept of social capital is quite a, may seem to the hard science community quite a, or a political community quite a fluffy concept. But it's really, really important and uh, it's probably leading to all sorts of issues across the country. Uh, not just to do with health, but also to, you know, voter rage and other stuff as communities disintegrate in some parts of the country. So I, I think that's a really, really interesting area. Um, and I've been looking at some of this in the northeast where the health fabric has frayed, frayed, frayed the most in the country. Um, so that's why it's uppermost in my mind. But the idea of being able to link directly social capital with ill health is quite hard, isn't it? I mean, it's a multi, it's a dynamic system. And I think there is room for judgment. And I guess this is where the public health community could be useful, where on what on this and other wider determinants to develop a consensus and, and, and solid judgment to say, well, there isn't an RCT on this, there isn't hard observational evidence, perhaps. But in our judgment, knowing these communities, this is what we believe. And this is our professional judgment. And that should hold sway. I don't think we should be weakened by that. Um, so I think there is something about our confidence as a community to step up and say things like this, if we if we truly believe them, as I, as I, as I say. Otherwise, we're just completely hamstrung by evidence, which is going to run out quite quickly on some of the most important things that we can influence. Can you tell us a little bit about research or engagement the Health Foundation are doing in this space? I know you've fairly recently the, the Health Foundation podcast that you present. Um, you recently had Kevin Fenton and Janelle Degrushi uh, on with you and, and you spoke about a recent Health Foundation piece of research where a bit more linked into, I suppose, the major condition strategy and, and the state of the health of the nation about, I think it's by 2040, one in five people will be living with a major condition. And, and within the um, major condition strategy in the UK, we've, we've combined a lot of these um, conditions such as mental health and physical health, trying to assimilate them into the understanding that people are, are dealing with multiple pressures, multiple conditions, and it's all part of a wider, wider context. We, I, I, I suppose, with a view of trying to appreciate some of that complexity. What current work are the Health Foundation doing to to try and advance the evidence base and maybe advance some some recommendations there? Yes. So I think I think just on that report for a minute. So what what we what we've been doing at the foundation, amongst many other things, is to try to project forwards the morbidity load in the population to 2040, um, and also to project forwards what are the um, for the health service, what are the resources that it needs, what is the workforce that it needs, in in, in and what's the capital that it needs. Uh, to respond to the to that morbidity load, and and, and the basic story there is so um, eighty percent of the morbidity it, huge increase we will see over the next um, time to twenty forty is because of the aging of the population. So we have to find ways, unless we're going to bankrupt our health system, of 
of managing chronic disease, multiple diseases better and more cheaply. So I think that's and and in a more integrated and coordinated way. So that's the point one. And, and, you know, time is short to try to figure that out. And I think that's the approach that Chris and colleagues are Janelle are using in the approach, the the major condition strategy, which will be, I understand will be published later this year to how best to to deal with the illness that's appeared. But but of course, there's also the risk factors that that lead to that those conditions. And is there anything we can do? So there, again, we do work on not just de- demonstrating this mountain of ill health, but also how could we be more muscular and robust in tackling the risk factors? Um, and if so so what can national government do but but importantly if national government won't act for political reasons perhaps or for other reasons what can local government do what can businesses do what can investors do to try to reduce the risk factors that will lead to this mountain and then so so we're doing work on that and then the other thing with with local government as well by the way and then the other thing, of course, is wider than that, is the wider determinants. And um, that's where you get it's it's much more um, difficult because the evidence base is weaker. We are constantly doing research on these things. We're constantly trying to um, put forward solutions to try to raise the profile of these issues in local government to, for them to help understand their agency and how they might measure their impact. So that's the kind of terrain we're on. And and we have a big portfolio of practical programmes and research to support all all of that. And the most recent thing we're about to publish is um, when do targets work? If you're going to have a cross-government strategy to improve the wider health, um, as we had in the 2000s, um you know, what role what should it look like how would the government departments work together for a long term strategy and uh, indeed what sort of targets would they work what sort of metrics so that's the kind of thing we we we're, we're working on all of the time and our website and publications are full of this kind of material on the health side that's quite apart from the nhs side so that's quite a long but there is quite a lot we can do it's a question of will really uh is the will and you know, ideology to an extent. Do you believe the state has a role in this area in mitigating risks um, or don't you? And to what extent? So, but there's there's a lot that can be done. And that's pretty well evidenced, actually. I look forward to the report you, you mentioned on, on targets. And I think these are all important questions that otherwise may not be asked or at least not asked as, as rigorously. So yeah, important work. Thank you. I mean, the other thing I must just sneak in here that people might see is that we've, um, for the first time, we funded a campaign. So we don't normally campaign, right? So we're sort of hopefully sober sober analysts and uh, funders, but we have funded a campaigns unit called Health Equals, which will be active at the party conferences. And that's and 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 the importance of mentioning that is um, is to raise the profile on health inequalities and the fact we can do something about it. But also, secondly, that it's not just the foundation. It, there's 26 other um, collaborating charitable organisations who are also working with us in a consensus way to to try to up this agenda uh, and feeding into it. So hopefully, you'll see some of that. If it's successful, you will have noticed at the body conferences. If it's less successful, you might not have. But uh, we 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 think that it's um, important to get a bit antsy on some of this stuff. Good, and and also good to hear of the the collaboration as well. Um, very important, yeah. In re- reference to, to to partners that are working equally hard in in this space. Moving back to you, uh, to you, if okay. Um, and just wondering if you can tell us about uh, an event or or situation in your career that uh, has been important to your development as as someone working in in public health. Yes, thank you. I mean, I think I've probably referred to it, actually. For me, it was that pivotal moment at uh, 29 when I went across to America and just had a whole year of breathing space to figure out having having done all this medicine and, you know, worked, was it 96 hour weeks as we did in those days? What, what uh, you know, just to give some breathing space to think about the, the future. And that was so profitable, I have to say, as I said before, it was so rich. So I think I think um, that was the pivotal moment to development and going on a slightly different course. But it didn't seem risky at the time. It just felt that it was it was good to be able to follow your nose and to have the freedom to do that for a bit. And I think uh, it's very important that in public health, these spaces are built into the training to allow people to do it with really 
as much freedom as possible. I mean, it's very easy, isn't it, at the moment, where when anything is funded like a fellowship, that you've got to have impact metrics, people have to come up with. And, and I, I do think that's important, but the most important things are, in, uh, are intangible and not measurable. So just the space, you know, fund good people, you know, who are who are thoughtful, give them space and they will do the right thing. I, I'm a complete that's old fashioned, I can hear, but it, it really is the, the the very the most effective way of um uh, of helping people some people to develop. Some people need rules and they need pr- parameters, but others, particularly those who are selecting themselves to, to the states. I think may may need and want a bit of space. So 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 that for me, I think was was the freedom. And then of course all the opportunities that came afterwards um, with working in the King's Hunter and Nuffield and here to be able to um, you know stretch into new areas and understand their links. And uh, I mean it's a great privilege. And for me, I could only find that space in the philanthropic world um because there aren't really punters in the way that you know if i were working for the UKHSA, if i were working for nhs england if i were working for a university they'd be students so you don't have that there's no external kind of parameters in that way i think yeah it's, it's also that that you know that diversity we mentioned within public health and for many people yeah it's, it's that ability to to have that breathing space and and to take a step back sometimes appreciate the complexity because very little of the work we do is is simple uh cause and effect so it's good yeah, you could have that breathing space I, I think that ties into um the final question we we had spoken about so you know, career tips for people starting in public health did, did you have a career tip for people starting in public health well, I suppose, I mean, and this probably sounds obvious and people will roll their eyes when they listen. I mean, I think the most important, I mean, obviously the most important thing is to work hard. And that that is like kind of a given, but it, it sometimes has to be said. I mean, working hard is very important. I think being reflective as you go along is also uh, critical, not just reflective because you've got a leadership course and that's giving you time, but actually to be constantly reflective of where you're going, what you're doing. And then I think the other thing is, is that um, what I see, and I think this is probably a sort of common, common currency these days, is that there is a bit of a race to, to get the, the sort of Christmas tree baubles on the tree by which, and, and I'm guilty of this MBA at Stanford or the, 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 the uh, um, attachment to the CMOs office, or whatever it is. And all that's important and fantastic uh, experience. But I do think it's important, just to continue the analogy, to just take the baubles off the Christmas tree and have a look at the Christmas tree itself. What's under there? What is the basic substrate you've got here with you? Um, because the baubles are important, but they are they are that they're, they're add-ons. You need to see what the substance is and try and be true to that as you go forwards, I think. And that includes what, how you like to work, who you like to work with, what your values are, and uh, and so on. And and I think only then, then the baubles become less important as opposed to the most obvious thing that you thrust at people when you meet them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So understanding why why you came into it, what you enjoy, where you can see yourself wanting to work over the next, you know, several decades, and and not just yeah, not just those those key those key tags or certificates or you know or, or points of conversation is it but that deeper deeper appreciation for the you know as, as you've you've alluded to throughout that that breadth of what we do um and why it, why it's important i think so and and sometimes sometimes it seems the right thing just to do something sort of off the beaten track and even though it might not lead to a bauble for some reason it kind of makes sense later as everyone says you you live life forwards but you understand it backwards and an example for me was that um, for some reason, I, I don't know quite why I did, but I, I agreed to be on the board of the Audit Commission, which is this, you know, it's a, now disbanded, of course, like many ALBs. But <laughs> this is a, you know, the public audit function for lo- local for the public sector organisations, particularly local government. And I really enjoyed that. I got a lot out of it. But at the time, I remember thinking, why am I doing this? Because it's kind of way off over there somewhere. But now as I go forwards and I'm thinking about devolution, I'm thinking about what would give government confidence to devolve more powers to local government where they can act more on, for example, the risk factors for health. Then all of that knowledge of local government and and accountability of local government, what I think of Devo, is wrapped up in some of that experience. So it really did make sense, as well as being very enjoyable at the time. So, 
so sometimes these little byways that you just just if, if you feel the tug just try and go for it as long as it's not too distracting uh, what I do also see is that sometimes people are grabbing at too much and they don't they cannot then distinguish a path forwards because everything's exciting do you see what I mean uh, mm -hmm. um, I, I see that quite a lot so you have to also be despite the fact you take a lot of different uh, experiences to go down some byways it, it's still important to that that it somehow consolidates some um so so that's where your reflection comes in about adding meaning to it all and 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 making a, the next choice uh, count true and and i think a very good summary that 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 personal individual career advice going forward speaking to the benefits of, of of a career in public health for the individual and the interest that, that lies there and and also the start of your answer talking to the the breadth of what the you and the health foundation are, are looking at doing working through you know devolution wider determinants you know going back to what we discussed at the beginning i i think to me an absolutely perfect example of of the breadth of what we do in public health why it's interesting why a career in it can be so rewarding it's been as you say it's been really enjoyable and uh, the podcast but also uh, public health is um you know it's been an utter privilege and it's been completely and utterly rewarding and very changeable as time go has gone on so endlessly fascinating and i hope to be around for quite some time <laughs> in the future that's really nice it's good to, yeah good to hear um and yeah couldn't agree more about um endlessly rewarding it's um it's a good choice good career um and i think we're we're lucky to be to be working in it um well thank you thank you for your time really yeah. do appreciate it